nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadow. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. In all my fortunes, you go before us. Nothing can stand. Psalm 28, 7 says, the Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him and he helps me. My heart leaps for joy and with my song, I praise him. Our joy is found in the person of Jesus Christ. No matter what's going on in our lives, we can find our joy in him. Stand with me as we praise him with that joy this morning. To the God who heals, we sing to the God who saves. 
We cannot over celebrate Christ's triumph over sin and death. The next song recounts Jesus' death and resurrection and reminds us that in his declarative defeat of sin and death, Christ secured for us eternal life in him. Because of his great sacrifice, we can praise the name of the Lord now and forevermore. I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled, and he died for me. And I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, and my Savior on the cursed tree. body bound and drenched in tears they laid him down in Joseph's tomb the entrance sealed by heavy stone Messiah still and all Oh, oh, oh. 
saints with my gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. Come on, sing it again. He shall return. And he shall return in robes of white. The blazing sun shall pierce the light. Then I will rise among the saints. My gaze transfixed upon Jesus' face. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him. All his heavenly armies, praise him. Sun and moon, praise him. All you shining stars, praise him. Highest heavens and you waters above the heavens, let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. He set them in position forever, and he gave an order that will never pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, all sea monsters and ocean depths. Praise the name of the Lord, our God. Oh, praise him. Oh 
Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the opportunity you give us each and every Sunday to come back to you um, and focus on worshiping you. Um, your mercy is endless time and time again. Um, we disobey your commandments, um, but you come back to us every single day. Um, and we thank you for that. We're grateful for that. Um, and we wouldn't have life on this earth without your mercy. Um, I just pray that you would help us um, focus on you this morning um, and that we would um, benefit our lives through this day. And you know I pray. Amen. This is the moment in our service where we take a couple minutes to greet each other. If Michelle was here, she'd say that's more like 10. There's a lot of people today. It might take closer to 10. Take a minute and greet each other. Thanks. Good morning. All right, let's grab a seat and uh, we will keep going here. Good to see everybody today in the midst of the hot summer. Fair's almost here, right? Fair is coming. Fair is coming. Today we want to take some time to remember uh, the Lord's sacrifice for us. Uh, and observe the Lord's Supper, communion, and um, I want to just remind everyone that uh, Jesus told his disciples, do this in remembrance of me. So uh, when we take communion, it's not a way for us to get more grace, it's not a way for us to assure our salvation, it is a, it's us remembering what Jesus did, that he died on the cross, shed his blood, his body was broken so that our sins could be paid for. Amen? It's, amen? It's so good to know that our sins are paid for, not because of anything we did, but because of what Jesus did. And uh, 
He said this, uh, Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 11. <clears throat> he said that uh, in verse 17, um, now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not that you come together not for the better, for, but for the worse. What does that mean? It means that they were coming together, there were divisions, there were problems, and and then they were recognizing the Lord's communion, and that wasn't correct. And they were trying to come so that they could eat more than somebody else. He said, that's not why we do this. That's not why we do this. And so uh, he said in verse 27, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of Christ. Verse 28, But let a man examine himself, And so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eats and drinks unworthily eats and drinks damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. So we should take a moment to just examine ourselves, to pray, to confess anything we need to confess, just to take care of issues, do business with God before we observe communion. So let's take a moment and do that. Uh, just a silent time of prayer and uh, examine yourself, talk to the Lord, whatever you need to do, and then I'll wrap it up with a word of prayer. Lord, we do come before you now with a humble heart and, God, with with thanksgiving, Lord, for what Jesus did for us. And, Father, that he, in our place, hung on that cross. Lord, his blood was spilled. Uh, He was brutalized, uh, God, for our sins and that the sins of the world were put upon him. And we just thank you, Lord, that because he paid the price for us, Lord, that we could be forgiven, <clears throat> uh, God, through having faith in him, to have a right relationship with you, and Father, to be put into your family. What a blessing. And as we remember the, uh, his blood that was spilled, his body that was broken, help us, Father, to give you thanks, give you praise, and Lord, to do it with a clean heart, and uh, with no division in our body, and we pray it in Jesus' name, amen. So at Grace Fellowship, if you know Christ as your Savior, you are um, uh, willing, you're able to take part. Um, You don't have to be a partner of our church, a member of our church, just to know that you know for sure you're saved, and you know for sure that uh, you're in God's family, and What we'll do here in a moment um, is have everybody stand, and um, I'm going to ask AJ to pray in a moment over the bread and the juice, and um, then we'll have you come down the middle, grab a cup, grab some bread, take it back to your seat, and then we'll take it all together, okay? So don't take it till we're ready, but let's stand together and uh, as we prepare. Uh, If you don't feel led to participate today, that's okay, just Step out, let people out, step back in, no pressure. Definitely don't want you to participate if you don't feel like you should. And uh, that's between you and the Lord. And I'm just going to ask AJ if he would have a word of prayer for our time together, and then we'll partake.
Amen. As you feel led, you can come down and take the elements. Jesus, when he had finished up the recognition of Passover and introduced the idea of uh, this new memorial that he was going to have them do, gave thanks. He thanked God, which we did already. Uh, But he said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take it together. After he had them take the bread, he did the same thing with the cup. And he said, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Amen. Let's stand together and close our time in a word of prayer. And we want to pray for Norma. She's in the hospital and uh, is getting over some blood clots. And pray for Kelly. Her father passed away um, this week, last week, uh, Bill Dyke. And uh, we just give you our sympathy, Kelly, and pray for your family as well. 
and I know many of you have needs as well. Uh, so let's just pray together to close our time. Father, we <clears throat> thank you, God, for what Christ did for us. Um, help us, God, to live differently uh, because of it. Help us, Father, to remember daily what Jesus has done for us, that, Lord, it would allow us to uh, live for you, to worship you each day, Father, to share the good news with our neighbors. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. church picnic uh, next week. Um, hey, that's better. I was like yelling. I'm like, why are they not responding to me? Okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, August 16th, we're going to do youth activity at the Stern Quest. Uh, address is there. It'll be a great time. Uh, always, they always do a great job with that. Um, August 17th, I want to remember uh, Kelly's father will be doing a celebration of life here uh, we'll be talking to you about food for that as well, so it's a couple weeks out. Um, and then Friend Day, September 22nd. And then you've been asking me about this for a long time. We have a celebration of life for Bernie, September 28th. So mark that on your calendar. Uh, it's a Saturday. Uh, we don't have the time yet. They're, the family's still just trying to make sure they've got a time that's going to work. A lot of them are out of state and that type of thing. Uh, so we'll get that to you, but September 28th um, is when we're going to do that. And then also school supply drive. It's, uh, school's going to be coming, and so uh, we're going to do a school supply drive. Destiny is going to lead that, um, and she'll have more information next week. We'll have bins here. We're going to focus on Capital View. We've done a lot with Willard, so we're going to kind of go back and forth with Capital View like to do something for our bus kids as well, our bus families, and so we're excited about that. Let's open our Bibles today to Exodus chapter 8. <clears throat> Exodus chapter 8. And let's stand together. I'm going to read verse 1 through 15. Exodus chapter 8. Let's stand. Grab your Bible. It's good to hear the pages turning. Good to hear the buttons clicking on your device. 
Um, <clears throat> Acts chapter 8, 1 through 15. I want to speak today about one more night with the frogs. Acts chapter 8, verse 1. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, Go unto Pharaoh and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. And if you refuse to let them go, behold, I will strike all your borders with frogs. And the river shall bring forth frogs abundantly, which shall go up and come into your house and into your bedchamber and upon your bed and into the house of your servants and upon your people and into your ovens and into your kneading troughs. And the frogs shall come up both on you and upon your people and upon all your servants. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, say unto Aaron, stretch forth your hand with your rod over the streams, over the rivers, over the ponds, and cause the frogs to come up upon the land of Egypt. And Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. And the magicians did so with their enchantments and brought up frogs upon the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go, that they may do sacrifice unto the Lord. And Moses said unto Pharaoh, Glory over me, when shall I entreat for you and for your servants and for your people to destroy the frogs from you and your houses, that they may remain in the river only? And he said, Pharaoh said, Tomorrow. And he said, Be it according to your word that you may know that there is none like unto the Lord our God. And the frogs shall depart from you and your houses and your servants and from your people. They shall remain in the river only. And Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh and cried unto the Lord because of the frogs which he had brought against Pharaoh. And the Lord did according to the word of Moses, and the frogs died out of the houses and out of the villages and out of the fields, and they gathered them together upon heaps, and the land stunk. But when Pharaoh saw that there was respite, he hardened his heart and listened not unto them, and as the Lord had said. Let's pray. Father, thank you for... Your word, we thank you, Father, for this passage, a familiar passage, Ten Commandments, plagues upon Egypt. But God, we pray that you would teach us from this passage the lessons you would have for us today. Lord, based upon what Israel, how they responded to this, how Egypt responded to it, how Pharaoh responded to it. We pray, God, that we would walk away Uh, with lessons that we can apply today. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. So as we look around the world today, we have to ask, you know, what evidence is going to convince somebody that God is real? That they should believe in him? That his word is real? And Pharaoh was faced with this, as we've already seen how Moses was called to go to Egypt to talk to Pharaoh, to take God's uh, command to Pharaoh, and um, how Pharaoh has resisted so far, right? And how Moses was hesitant. But God is working in Moses' life, God is working in Aaron's life, God is working in Pharaoh's life. And so today, in this particular passage, verse 1, we see, if you, if you want to follow on the handout, letter A, that the command to Pharaoh is repeated. Moses went back to Pharaoh and said, verse 1, Thus saith the Lord, let my people go, that they may serve me. It's the command that he's already given to him several times. And Moses continues, or Pharaoh continues to resist, right? And how many times do we see in the scriptures God just gives someone a command and they resist? They 
They don't want to do it right away. I mean, look at Jonah being called to go to Nineveh. Um, the disciples to just believe in Christ and to follow Christ and be open uh, to Christ. And they're following, but they still have doubts. They still have doubts. They still have doubts. Uh, we see all the churches in Revelation that struggle with, with the commands of God. And here we see Pharaoh just like, I, I'm God in Egypt. I don't know who your God is. But he's beginning to see, right? He's beginning to see, wow, Moses and Aaron have something going on here. And uh, <clears throat> he gives them, Moses gives them this command, and um, he still does not do it. And Moses says, if you don't do this, Here's what's going to happen. He said, I will, God will, verse 2 and 3 and 4, is going to send frogs to your land. If one of your friends came to you and said, if you don't believe in God, here's what's going to happen. Probably the last thing that would convince you that God is real, is that you had a few frogs jump on your porch, right? Okay? That's probably what Pharaoh was thinking. Like, okay, Moses, bring some frogs. Bring it on. I mean, frogs? Really? How about fire from heaven? You know, I'll believe. How, how about, you know, massive floods? I might believe. How about darken the sun for a week? I might believe. But frogs? Frogs? The lesson here, even though Pharaoh hasn't realized it yet, is that there are consequences for not obeying the Lord. This particular consequence was another plague on your land, Pharaoh. First it was blood, the water turning to blood, and you kind of dismiss that. And now you're dismissing God's command again, and he's going to send frogs. Letter B, we see that God covers everything. Egypt with frogs. The frogs were everywhere and intolerable. It wasn't just a few frogs jumping on Pharaoh's porch. It was like, I mean, imagine this auditorium. Everything covered with frogs. You're sitting on frogs. You're stepping on frogs. There's frogs in the communion plates. There's frogs on my platform. There's frogs on the keyboard. There's frogs inside the guitar. There's frogs dropping from the ceilings on you. I mean, they're everywhere. It was obvious, like, they'd never seen anything like this. It says that they were in their ovens. Can you imagine going to fix breakfast? You've got to sweep the frogs out first. They were in their places where they prepare their food, kneading troughs. Uh, they were there. They were, they were everywhere. And Pharaoh, like he did already once with the magicians, said, well, okay, magicians, you come up. We can't let Moses, like, show us up here. So I want you to produce some frogs. So guess what? They came, and who knows how they did it. We don't know exactly how they did it. But verse 7, and the magicians did so, with their enchantments, and brought up frogs upon the land of Egypt. <clears throat> I want you to think about that for a minute. Pharaoh's like, we're already covered with frogs. Let's get the magicians to bring some more frogs. Does that make any sense to you? We're already covered with frogs. I'm going to have my magicians do it and bring more frogs. And all of a sudden, he's probably thinking, why did I do that? Now our problems are just multiplied. I've got frogs from Moses' as God. I've got my own magician's frogs. Like, we can't get out of this. They made it worse. The magicians made it worse. Why didn't he ask him, magicians, why didn't you ask all the frogs to go away? <clears throat> he made it, they made it worse. And the lesson for us in this is when the world tries to play God, it only 
increases their suffering. When the world tries to play God, it only increases their suffering. I mean, do you know people that just continually just resist God? And they just, they, they have no one to turn to, their life falls apart. I mean, look at the Tower of Babel when they tried to build a tower to the heavens to be like God, and he completely changes all their languages, gives them all different languages. They can't talk to each other. They're all dispersed. You can't do trade in business because they don't know how to talk to each other. And it was chaos. Don't we see that today? The nations raging against God, the world raging against God, and like we are going to be God. We will say when a baby can be born or not be born. We will, you know, have our own solutions to wealth and poverty or whatever, and we have so much poverty throughout the world. We will, you know, come up with our own philosophies to educate our children and take prayer out of the school and take Bibles out of the school and take God out of the school. How's that working? How does that work? We constantly see the world trying to push God out and and be God, just like these magicians, and it only increases suffering. Finally, Pharaoh comes to his senses, you know, after however many days of these frogs. And uh, verse 8, then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, pray the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me and my people, and I will, I will, I'll let the people go. Pharaoh kind of saw the writing on the wall here and, and started to, like, we've got to do something here because I can't do anything with this. And uh, you, Moses, you get rid of these frogs and I will let the people go. And it's interesting, he, he, he said, put the frogs back in the river. Like, where they go. Let's put them where they go. <clears throat> I don't want them out here anymore, and I will obey the Lord. Notice this, and this is where the title, the sermon title, comes from. Moses asked him, <clears throat> uh, verse 9, when shall I pray for you? When do you want me to do this? If you were in Pharaoh's shoes, or I was in Pharaoh's shoes, what would your answer be to that question? My answer to that question would be, take away the frogs right now. (laughs) Right now. We've been with them day and night for however long. They're everywhere. We can't eat. We can't sleep. We can't do anything. Take them away right now. Notice what Pharaoh says. He says, tomorrow. Take them away tomorrow. The idea here is that, because Moses said, Be it according to your word that you may know there is none like unto the Lord. The idea in that passage was Pharaoh saying, well, maybe they'll just go away on their own between now and then. If I just say tomorrow, maybe we'll give it one more night, maybe they'll be gone. And Moses says, you know what? I'm going to pray to God that it is tomorrow Be it according to your word, so that you may know that right now God has heard my prayer, and that there is none like unto the Lord our God. There is none. He didn't want him to he he didn't want him to think that, oh, okay, well, we just waited long enough and it was gone. He wanted, Moses wanted Pharaoh to know that's when it's going to happen. It's going to happen tomorrow. It's not going to happen tonight. It's not going to happen in two days. It's going to happen tomorrow. 
for this reason, Pharaoh, that you will believe in God. You will know that God is real. Know that God is real. There's a great lesson in this for us. <clears throat> you know, I, I don't know if you're like me, but you read through the Old Testament and you, you know, you're reading through Numbers and you're reading through Deuteronomy and you're just like, okay, what lesson's in this for me? What, what, they're like, okay, that's great for Jonah, it's great for Moses, it's great for Abraham. What lesson's in it for me? But if we look, there's always something ap- applicable for us, right? There's always something that God is wanting to teach us. And the lesson here from Exodus chapter 8 is to obey the Lord today. To obey the Lord today. Not tomorrow. <clears throat> Not when we think it's a good time. God, I will serve you when I get done with school. God, you've asked me to do this, but let me just get my family started. Let me get my career started. Let me take care of this situation with my family. I got this job situation. God, I'm going to get a promotion. Let me go two more years, get my 401k in place, and then I will do whatever you want me to do. I want you to know that's a dangerous position to be in and a dangerous position attitude to have because God will do what he wants when he wants with us or without us and we rob ourselves of the blessing we rob ourselves of the blessing by not just jumping on board right when we know God is working in our life now let me be clear Obviously, there's time for prayer, right? There's time for discernment. There's time for seeking counsel. There's all of that. But I know people who have just put off a clear direction from the Lord and chose not to do it, and they're just miserable. I mean, they haven't lost all their finances or their health or whatever, but inside, they are miserable. I know men who have just felt that call to preach and, and not followed up on it. And the old saying goes, there's no one more miserable in the pews of a church than man that's been called to preach from the pulpit of the church. And they've refused. To obey the Lord right now. Those fishermen, the disciples, when they were called and Jesus said, follow me, What did they do? They dropped their nets and followed. I'm reminded of Jesus and the parable of the people that he called. And first, let me go bury my father. First, I've bought some land. Let me go look at the land. You mean you didn't look at the land before you bought it? You got to go. You got to go look at it now. He's like, let the dead bury their dead and follow me to serve the living God and tell people the living gospel. Obey the Lord today. Letter D, Moses, Pharaoh asked Moses to do this. Moses does it. He takes away the, the frogs and Pharaoh breaks his promise. He breaks his promise. <clears throat> Notice that he asked, Pharaoh had asked Moses to send all the frogs back to the river. But what he did is they all died. So imagine that with me as well. We're sitting in here, and there are thousands and thousands and thousands of dead frogs around you, on you. And imagine trying to clean all of that up. I worked right out of high school at a hog confinement for a while. Red Rock Port, west of Monroe. And on a school break, a Christmas break, I had two weeks off, so I went to work at the hog confinement. And just before I got there, about a week before, 
they had a disease called, I think it's TGE, it's an intestinal disease, go through all of their confinement, and it killed every pig in that confinement that was about 30 pounds and less. I mean, we're talking hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dead pigs. So for two weeks, I went with a big cart and a shovel and gloves and picked up dead pigs and put in the cart and rolled them outside and dumped them in big holes. And not to get too graphic, but by the end of the two weeks, when you would grab a pig by the tail and pick it up, Sometimes the whole pig didn't come with it. Okay, I'm just telling you, that's what was happening. It was stinky. It was terrible. It was the last two weeks I ever worked in a hog confinement. And that's what Moses was dealing with, or what Pharaoh was dealing with here. They're, they're cleaning up all these frogs. Why didn't God just send them back to the river like, like Pharaoh had asked? It was a good reminder to Pharaoh. This is what happens if you don't obey God, if you don't obey God. The evidence was all around him. It said that that they piled all these frogs up, they gathered them together in heaps, and the land stunk. It stunk. Instead of Pharaoh... Like responding, like, okay, I know. God is God. This is the like, third thing that I've seen that's miraculous. And responding to it, it says that he hardened his heart and listened not unto them. He saw that, oh, okay, Whew, this one's over. This one's done. I can go back to doing my own thing. And he hardened his heart. And the lesson for us today is that God's rebuke can either harden you or soften you. It can harden you or soften you. Hebrews 12, 6, obviously this is different because we're talking unbelievers here in Egypt But with believers, Hebrews 12, 6 says that whosoever the Lord loves, he chastens. He chastens. He convicts. The Holy Spirit convicts. And that's a good lesson. That's a good lesson. To respond to that conviction, to respond to that rebuke, to... Uh, be restored in our close fellowship with the Lord when we sin or we disobey or we don't do. And just, we should have short accounts with God. Short accounts. We do something wrong. I'm sorry, Lord. Forgive me. Help me to do what's right. I didn't obey, Lord. Forgive me. Help me to do what's right. Short accounts. Constant prayer. To have those days of refreshing with the Lord. Today, as we wrap up, just a question, life application question. What spiritual decision are you putting off that you need to take care of today? What spiritual decision are you putting off? Is it, a, is it a sin you need to take care of and talk to somebody about and talk to God about? Obviously, when we sin and believers, we're not losing our salvation. But 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's written to believers, by the way. And we, we lose a close relationship with the Lord when we sin. Let's take care of that sin. Maybe it's something he's asked you to do. Maybe it's serving in the church. Maybe it's talking to a neighbor. Maybe it's restoring a relationship with a broken, a broken relationship with a family member. Maybe it's a coworker you're having problems with you need to forgive. Maybe it's something from way in the past that you need to forgive. Hebrews says that 
the root of bitterness defiles all that are around. Do you know that people are, that are bitter, that haven't taken care of things, man, they're just angry, right? They're just angry all the time. They're biting people's heads off. They're short with people. They don't forgive. They, they, they're just bristle at things. Man, that's, God has so much more for us than that, right? He wants so much more for us. Maybe it's, maybe it's baptism. Maybe you need to be baptized, it's hard to go to Africa or to be a missionary or be a missionary across the street when you haven't done the first thing that God asks a believer to be baptized. Or maybe you need to officially join a church, our church, another church, whatever. You need. Acts chapter 2 says they were baptized and added to the church. They were recognized as a... It's a way for us, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 to recognize each other and members and pray for one another and, and, and help each other. We see it in the Scriptures. What is it? What spiritual decision are you putting off that you need to take care of today? Maybe it's you haven't put your faith in Christ. Maybe you don't know for sure you're going to heaven. Maybe you haven't responded to the gospel in faith and you need to take care of that today. If I ask you today on a scale of 1 to 10, how confident are you that you're going to heaven, what would your number be? Is it 7, 8, 9? If it's, if it's that, you need to look within. Look within. Because Jesus said, whosoever believes in me, I will give them everlasting life. Everlasting life. Let's stand together and pray today as the worship team comes. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you, God, for the Old Testament. We thank you, God, that it's relevant, that, Lord, uh, you proved yourself to those in Egypt. You proved yourself to Moses. You proved yourself to Abraham. Lord, through many signs and wonders, And God, we see that people would resist. Help us, God, to be open to your leading. Help us, God, to be people of the book. Help us to be obedient, Father, to what you would have us to do on a daily basis so we can have that close walk with you. And Father, I pray for anybody today who has never put their faith in Christ, that before they leave this building, they would look to Jesus and say, Jesus, I believe in you, and I ask that you give me everlasting life and forgive me of my sins. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Jesus, my Redeemer, there is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness, my freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus.
the future sure the price it has been paid for jesus bled and suffered for my pardon and he was raised to overthrow the grave to this i hold my sin has been defeated jesus